we are ready to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Joao. And it, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here with you all and uh, particularly to be with my friends Joao and my friends Emmanuel um, once more. And, and uh, Emmanuel um, has given you a very lively and very profound account of uh, the existential dimension to the, the COVID crisis, the dimension according to which it's a kind of mass trauma um, and, and how that might relate to the limits of a phenomenological treatment of, of the event. Now, I've got an awful lot of questions I'd like to put to um, Emmanuel and uh, a huge number of issues arise from that. And I could talk about this in that register, but what I'm actually going to do is talk about the crisis in, in, a, in a rather more prosaic um, sort of social, political, ethical, to a degree, theological register. So I hope nonetheless that you, the other participants, the audience might be able to try to put together Emmanuel's existential approach and, and my uh, more political approach because without doubt the situation we're in um, very validly has both those dimensions. Uh, so I will now um, make um, my remarks. The coronavirus pandemic uh, has indeed the nature of a genuine event, as Emmanuel has said, because its reality is in excess of our attempts fully to account for it as to origins, causes, extent, implications, or indeed our experience of it, as Emmanuel ha has said. To some extent, we do have the sense that we no longer exist, at least for an interval. I think this is absolutely the case. Nevertheless, just how epochal an event it will prove is not so certain. In Emmanuel's terms, will it prove to be just a sort of temporary quasi-trauma, or will it really be a permanent trauma, uh, which means we have to become um, something different? Um, how absolutely different that is, is one of the questions that I probably like to put to him. For some commentators, it remains simply a temporary interruption legitimately requiring an extraordinary, but um, nonetheless not permanent response. For others, it's a sign of a much larger and ongoing ecological crisis. Both these groups tend to welcome a current return to greater levels of state action and public cooperation. But for still other people, this extraordinary response is not to be regarded um, as either just provisional or as um, basically benign, but rather as an intensification of existing and sinister um, political and economic processes, tending to both mass surveillance and to um, mutual isolation. So from that point of view, if this is a mass trauma, it, it's an engineered um, trauma. This contrast is somewhat echoed in terms of spiritual and religious assessments of our current predicament. For many people, the, the pandemic is a warning of our <coughs> disordered, human relationship to life on earth. But for dissenters, the response to it already implies an overvaluing of life as such, which is so excessively now foregoes risk as to endanger our living of truly worthwhile and meaningful lives, perhaps in preparation for a greater life beyond death. Let's briefly consider 
these three controverted dimensions of our current global situation. How truly significant is this crisis in historical terms? Does it portend the end of neoliberalism or the intensification of tyranny in the name of emergency? These are two alternative interpretations. Are we now putting life before money or instead putting a calculus of death limitation before the risky pursuit of a truly human existence? Again, this possibility of a clash between life and a meaningful life, a significant life. First, is it true that nothing is ever going to be the same again? Or is this just a long drawn out hiatus, as Alan Badu has argued? In, in Emmanuel's terms, sometimes we're in a case where we think we're in a trauma, but it turns out not to be a trauma. Our child, whom we thought was dead, turns up again, for example. In a sense, <coughs> this is an old fashioned occurrence. There have been many pandemics throughout history, and this one, in those terms, is comparatively mild. It's not like the Black Death in the 14th century. And plagues or pandemics are just bolts from the blue. They're merely metaphorical attacks by banal natural agents. And so they lack in any kind of meaning. COVID-19 is just the latest in a series of relatively mild modern plagues whose effect is certainly severe, but nonetheless passing, transitory. It may intensify certain existing trends towards digitalization and working from home and increase the attack of basements endured by those workers who can't work from home. But really on this view, that's all. No one seriously saw this coming and the measures taken against the pandemic are simply pragmatic. They're akin to necessary emergency measures in wartime. A political switch to more Keynesian economic tactics does not therefore indicate any permanent alteration. And these tactics have been deployed to defend local capitalism in the face of the suspension of some normal global linkages. The financial sector has still been prioritized during this crisis, and workers have only been assisted to the degree that the market cannot sustain a total collapse in demand beyond a certain level. To a degree, um, the philosopher Bruno Latour confirms this view by arguing that the COVID crisis is not a dress rehearsal for coming ecological apocalypse. Again, it's too old fashioned a kind of event for that. As we can see by the circumstance that it is reinvigorated the role of the nation state and modes of biopolitical control that Michel Foucault identified as being at work ever since roughly the year 1800. Governments have deliberately sought to play the selectively medical role of extending some lives while they've economize the worth of others, which are seen as sacrificially indispensable to the running of the economy and the sustaining of human life in general. What is more, a typically modern duality of culture versus nature has also been reinvoked. We are supposedly in human solidarity against an alien natural force with which we are said to be at war. But the deeper ecological crisis which we face really isn't like this. It's first of all a far more general threat, which cannot be handled by national agencies alone. But secondly, in this instance, it is, in the case of ecological crisis, it is as if human beings are the virus threatening nature, although nature includes themselves. And the planet will survive, it's really in the end, human life, though also much animal life that is under threat. Just for this reason, meeting this more 
general threats of climate change, species decline, and so forth, requires a questioning of the divide between nature and culture. On this view, then, the crisis might not change things as much as we think. And it's not all that obviously in a continuum with ecological crisis in general, any more than the bubonic plague has got anything to do with climate change. There are reasons both to heed this double caution and somewhat to qualify it. It can be contradictory for Alain Badiou to say both that no one saw this crisis coming and that it is simply yet another in the series of SARS viruses. Just for the latter reason, although no one could have predicted this pandemic arriving just at the beginning of the 2020s, experts have in fact been warning about the likelihood of pandemics of this kind for years, and governments have been variously preparing for them. And while one can compare the current crisis to the one occasioned by Spanish flu around 1920, vastly increased globalization and governmentality means that the level throughout the world of an organized suspension of normal life is without historical precedent. So I'm agreeing with uh, Emmanuel here. There's something extraordinary about seeing Paris and London and New York empty. And it's only because of very recent technological developments um, that everybody is able to stay stuck in their houses and, and to work from home uh, and, 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 and so on. Um, and the experience of this as something happening everywhere and in a similar fashion is, sort of, is surely something unique. You know, this, if we maybe set aside the, the world wars for the moment, you could say maybe this is the first um, trauma of the whole planet in, in Emmanuel's terms. Moreover, recent novel viruses, including this one, cannot merely be seen as acts of God. To the contrary, they usually involve a jumping from wild animals to humans, and that's been made more likely by um, increased human activity. Not merely a perhaps unavoidable further human penetration into the wild, but a corralling of the wild into more cramped spaces, reduction of species diversity, diversity and of animal development of immunity. Additionally, as by due notes, globalization renders far more likely the meeting of archaic practices like wet markets with ultra modern communications. Old dangers are vastly compounded by new ones. One meeting, meaning of globalization is the extraordinarily bizarre um, mixture of the archaic and the futuristic. In a sense, that's been going on ever since Captain Cook um, caught sight of the Australian mainland. Therefore, as Latour himself stresses, the pandemic can't without obfuscation be understood in terms of a nature versus culture duality. We're not really threatened just by a biological agent. It is only an aberrant agent because its agency is compounded by many levels of human agency, both individual and accidental. Whether we're talking about the traders of the Wuhan market or Chinese scientists in a laboratory. And it's also networked and habitual. Various economic links and political systems, besides different human, ge human genetic potentials, which have hugely affected the impact of the virus um, in, in different places and at different times. Its impact hasn't by any means been the same e everywhere. Our various human responses will unpredictably affect how long the virus endures and how far it mute, mutates. That needs to be said also. For example, um, the more the virus is handled piecemeal by market and um, interstate rivalry, the more likely it is that the virus will dangerously mutate. mutate. 
because overall global eradication and the pursuit of more comprehensive types of vaccine um, just have not been um, sought for. In other words, um, you know, the drug companies probably like the fact that they keep on having to produce new drugs. They don't really, the market doesn't really have an interest in searching for a much more comprehensive mode of once for all um, vaccination. Things are not set up that way. And to a really shocking degree, um, states have um, been in competition with each other. And there's been uh, an absolutely lamentable um, failure to vaccinate people in poorer countries, even though uh, that has implications for people in wealthier countries in the end. So for these reasons, and also because there are likely to be other pandemics in the future, we can't be sure even at the maybe natural level whether this crisis is here to stay or not. For the reasons we've outlined, it has indeed both features of a traditional plague and others that are related to a much more recent disordering of human interactions with nature. What is more, even if more specifically ecological threats are somewhat different to the pandemic, the current crisis already presents some of the dilemmas that those threats will pose far more acutely. How to balance the need for collective action with the sustaining of human freedom. How to achieve at once a pragmatically needed devolution of action and responsibility to local level, and at the same time to increase an equally required global coordination and solidarity. What lives to protect and what lives can we validly put at risk? How to integrate human dignity with natural equilibrium? How to balance survival with what survival might be for? The second question is how are we to assess the political response to the great pause in our current lives? One's naturally inclined to agree with Slavoj Žižek that we should welcome the fact of an apparent increase in human solidarity, even if, or perhaps all the more, because it has to be exercised sacrificially through human isolation. Perhaps that relates to Emmanuel's idea of that what we share is loneliness, even though I think I want to put some pressure on that notion. It's good that there proves to be a limit to the human tolerance of economies and, and utility. The stark exception of Sweden, one of the most modern and secular countries on earth, with households actually too weak to sustain um, a retreat, is in a negative confirmation of this encouraging reality. In the end, even a, the current uh, British Tories, essentially um, led by a kind of rebel uh, Brexit faction that has entirely subverted um, my country, in, in my view. Even they were obliged to back away from a policy of deliberately slaughtering the old and the sick, which they initially entertained. So really, hardly anyone agrees with Giorgio Gambon's semi-conspiratorial view that COVID-19 um, is just a particularly virulent influenza bug, which has occasioned an excessive reaction designed to suspend all normal procedures in the name of a permanent rule by exception. Though nothing like as dangerous as some once thought, it is nonetheless sufficiently dangerous as to justify the emergency measures taken unless one has adopted a callous regard for human existence. Nor is it plausible to think that the ruling powers could really have desired a situation which puts their own wealth and their own power in all sorts of 
possible in peril. And it, in particular, it puts the situation of the West in relation to China in very much increased peril. All sorts of people in poorer countries who were loath to take Chinese aid, for example, have been much happier to take that aid since uh, the COVID crisis arrived. On the other hand, the view that the crisis indeed provides for both the state and for capital a convenient suspension of the usual norms is rather more plausible. In circumstances of lockdown, the power of the digital giants and of the rising online retailers has been greatly increased. The same applies to the reinforcement of home working, which by isolating workers from shared solidarity tends to increase their controllability from a distance. The apparent reversal of Fordism here should not disguise from us the way in which this can operate as a covert proletarianization of the professional and lower managerial classes, submitting them more and more to routinized procedure. At the same time, the leverage of outdoor workers is not necessarily going to be increased, far from it, given the spur of um, increased unemployment and the militarized disaggregation and deunionization. Also, these workers, the very opposite, uh, may ensue. What is more, despite arguments about the relative virtues of suppression versus herd immunity and of balancing immediately threatened lives versus sustaining um, the economy, and with, without doing that, you're threatening lives in other ways. In the end, all governments have adopted a mixing of those strategies. They've all attempted some sort of balance. If we wanted instead to mitigate our having to make these difficult choices, we'd have to switch to a totally different sort of political and economic order, perhaps a much more communitarian in the British, not the French sense, uh, and personalist sort of um, political order. We would at least require the degree of social trust and of central with local coordination that has allowed democratic and largely Christian South Korea to adopt a policy of wholesale track and tracing together with selective isolation in order quickly to contain the virus altogether. Perhaps South Korea presents us with a certain hopeful um, com mixture of a traditional Confucian attitude with more recent um, Christian ones. To a lesser degree, um, much more notably subsidiarist and federalist Germany has achieved all this far better than the United Kingdom. The most successful thing that's happened in the United Kingdom has been the vaccine rollout. And to an extraordinary extent, that has depended on local and voluntary um, forces um, being stimulated and coordinated. It has not been just a matter of state central control. More fundamentally, if we wanted to mitigate our situation, we'd have to revisit the entire question of what work is for and how the goals of personally fulfilling and socially beneficial work might require different balances between working alone and together in direct physical proximity. We would have to consider how comprehensively to minimize outdoor dangers, to compensate for them, and to provide a real and generous bedrock of security for those threatened with a more precarious existence, including the threat of unemployment. Indeed, we would try to remove that precariousness and insecurity altogether by fully recognizing the equal social importance of difficult and difficulty of more basic and often dirty tasks like building, transporting, serving, and caring. 
we would have to come to see that these are arts also, and we should seek to render them more so. Against these criteria, one has to conclude that after all, the crisis will probably change little except to intensify existing negative um, tendencies. Behind the current tension on the secular left as to whether we should welcome the new wartime solidarity engendered by the crisis, or rather bewail the inhibition of liberty that it brings in its wake. One can detect far older disagreements as to whether we are to think of the more alien face of the modern and the negatively dialectical impact of enlightenment of term, in terms of primarily the Marxist alienation of labor on the one hand, as in the case of Baju and Zizek, or of Weberian bureaucratic control on the other, variously and sometimes alternatively seen as Heideggerian technocracy by Derrida, Nancy, and Bernard Stiegler, or as Foucauldian biopolitics by Agamben and to a degree by Latour. Is capital the alienated human master agent which only the true agency of labor can overthrow? Or is it rather the case that the problem is the very fantasizing in practice of a single agency of control termed the political state, which attempts to suppress the inherent multiplicity of human agency through systems of complex instrumentalization, surveillance and intrusion into existential and vital levels of human reality. On the second account, what we need to liberate is not really unified human labor, as rather the non-alienated humans, so, uh, sorry, it's not really unified human labor as non-alienated human subjectivity, but rather to liberate a multiplicity of interacting agencies, both human and otherwise. So either human beings should suspend operation and recover a mythical Edenic animality, um, as for a gambon on the second account, or else engage in a democratic constitutional negotiation with all other natural agencies, as for Bruno Latour. Depending on one's preference, either for Marx or for the Weberian left, one may see either promise or else menace in the current crisis, perhaps. Yet one could argue that it's possible to synthesize these two perspectives on the negative aspect of modernity. On the one hand, labor is alienated in part because as John Ruskin, Patrick Geddes and Lewis Mumford saw, materialism as such is unable to envisage a noble and spiritual end for human work. On the other hand, the state does not just pursue power for its own sake. It also pursues an alienated power, only defined as control because of the loss of a shared spiritual horizon. Within this perspective, one can then try more to integrate the Weberian um, within a qualified version of the Marxist critique. Just as capitalism needs to render naturally available goods scarce and to invent new goods in short supply, if it is to sustain competition and profitability. So likewise, our entire politics tends to, as it were, economize both life and other natural realities by rendering them selectively rare and more precarious and by offering relatively exclusive technocratic remedies and solutions subject at once to market forces and to bureaucratic regulation. Currently, we see how the remedies for the COVID crisis are um, scarce, and to some extent, that is a contrived scarcity. In either case, power is increased to the same measure as profit, just as capitalist profit is inseparable from power, surveillance, and control. 
What is sought in either case is the empty and narcissistic libido dominandi that was so long ago diagnosed by Saint um, Augustine. Perhaps uh, I could venture um, if, if control is the ultimate loneliness, uh, the ultimate sad thing to do by yourself. It's not an accident that the exercise of power in this quasi-totalitarian way tends to make us all lonely. That's perhaps slightly as an angle to some of the things Emmanuel was saying. This is the aim of liberalism in the precise sense of a philosophy predicated on the primacy of the individual will. A philosophy which I think is incompatible with any real um, Christian understanding of things. Ultimately, it's the failure of secular thought to isolate the shared framework of liberalism as the real problem that leads to the oscillation between alternatively money or power as being the prime villain, masked villain, if you like, of modernity. Or else it is admitted that critique does not really break with the liberal framework. Zizek, for example, admits that Marxism is a form of liberalism. Inverting Victor Orban, Zizek roundly declares communists are liberals with a diploma, liberals who've studied a bit harder. What this ultimately means for him in a surely a purely Hobbesian and Lockean limit lineage is that the subject in our open freedom is dialectically identical with the open randomness, um, Emmanuel's chaos of matter. Obviously, this provides us, as Nietzsche saw, with no metaphysical grounds upon which to question the operations of pure power, nor of alienated labor, nor of a seduction by illusory spectacle. Since for this vision, there's no reality behind the Lacanian reel of the inaccessibly uncanny specter that is matter slash subjectivity nor yet of an ecological domination by human beings over nature, since this domination is on this um, nihilistic account itself the most natural thing of all. The equally metacritical and metaphysical task then for me would rather be to discover not a dialectical identity between the subject and nature, but a creative tension between them, rooted in their shared participation in a transcendent order, upholding the reality both of the spirit and of objectively desirable ends of spiritual expression through work upon matter and interaction with other natural and to a degree spiritual agencies. This brings me on to my third tension, which is between those like Zizek, who celebrate our current concern with life as such, and those who, like a gambon, warn of our now being reduced to bare life, which will eventually prove to be no sort of meaningful life all um, whatsoever. It will be, if you like, a loneliness for all of us, not tempered by love. Interestingly, this debate has its ecclesiastical and theological equivalent. Overwhelmingly, religious leaders have sanctified the new priority for the medical, at least for the moment. But others, and most extremely Rusty Reno, the editor of First Things in America, have suggested that um, this is but an ultimate secular encouragement to see any old sort of life as more important than a fulfilled spiritual life. Uh, again, we've got the conflict between life as such and life as something worth living, life with a point to life. <laughs>
Thus, they've argued against the shutting of churches and the ending of public worship. Once again, I think that both sides have got a valid point. It's rather hysterical to claim that measures adapted in the face of war or plague are really intended in all perpetuity. After all, they celebrated mass outside and with social distancing during the great plagues at the end of the Middle Ages. And because we are embodied creatures, mere living is not to be despised. It's not to despise, for example, in Aquinas's account of the natural law, because it's the basis of more exalted modes of existence. On the other hand, we know very well that wartime emergency measures often do survive, though sometimes for good as well as for ill. But it's also worryingly evident that churches have often, and particularly in, um, in Britain, been closed to an unnecessary degree, and that churches, along with other less utilitarian, more convivial modes of public space, including libraries, clubs, and pubs, are often destined to be the last things to be reopened, precisely because they're less about bare living and bare economic um, surviving. In the longer term, just as we can see how the pandemic bodes to increase human isolation and lack of real physical and real face-to-face -face contact, thereby favoring a huge increase of divide and rule by the machinic forces that control us. So also we can see how it bows to increase an over-obsession with the avoidance of danger, the avoidance of suffering, and an endless and self-internalized quantification of risk from minute to minute, which we could now perform on our iPhones in an obsessive fashion. In the cases of motion and transport, of, for example, walking, climbing, cycling, and sailing, as also with human, including sexual interactions, it's obvious that we do as individuals regard certain risks as constantly worth running. We tend to become more inhibited by them when we look at averages and are provided with that terrible word, solutions for their avoidance and minimization. But all those things are provided through an impersonal aggregation of our lives by the state and the market. It is when we are persuaded to regard ourselves as objects um, through the gaze of the public spectacle, to become objects to ourselves even when we're not ill, as Emmanuel has described. It's then that we cease to live with ourselves as self-posited subjects, able spontaneously to sense which risks should be over undergone and which risks should be avoided. All of course, according to varying inborn and acquired temperament, which is also part of who we are. Some of us are naturally more heroic than others, although maybe we're all a little bit um, heroic, even if we all despair that we will never be saints, as Leon Bois so famously remarked, unless we are actually saints, of course. The reverse side of this alienation from natural risk is the implicit taking on of a massive and generalized risk by the combined forces of capital and power, which in reality exposes us all to exponentially increased risks of illness, both physical and mental, and ultimately a danger of death all the time. So I would submit that just as pure power, in fact, depends like capital upon rendering what is natural scarce. So also an apparently sanitized removal of individual risk, our obsessive concern with health and safety, 
really depends on, upon an alienation of risk, which consolidates risk into one collective peril, exactly like a nuclear bomb. And indeed, the nuclear bomb is a literal illustration of what I'm talking about. Thus, rule through the inhibition of risk is really rule through the permanent suspension in both senses of a massive risk, of a huge metaphorical axe over all our heads. Thus, we're only, as Agamben's work recognizes, reduced to our life because this life can ultimately be discarded, like the excluded scapegoat outside the gates of the city. The logic of valuing life as such without risk is not that we really value life, but that all life has been economized, subordinated to power, money, and information, even and contradictorily the lives of the powerful and the rich themselves in the end. Liberalism is nihilism and inversion. If only, as for liberalism, negative freedom, the freedom of the moderns, ma matters, then this is only the disinhibition of material force. And so it is, in the end, um, identical um, with the warding off of death. It's the mere postponement of death in the end. The churches then, I think, should not have gone quite so quiet during this crisis, nor have so readily colluded in rendering sacred spaces invisible. It would have been more possible to do that in perfectly or relatively safe ways than I think has been undertaken. In this context, one could also note that Zizek is after all at one with the Gambon in warning against the global cult of so-called humanitarian aid. The supposed purely human distress of the starving, the ecologically immiserated of refugees and war victims is really the distress of human beings deprived of that political sucker, which according to Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas is integral to our humanity. This distress is largely produced with their everyday right hands by the very agents of globalized speculative digital capitalism, like Bill Gates and George Soros, who with their nocturnal left hands then seek to placate the results in a supposed merely ethical fashion. Their real aims are actually to suppress popular and local resistance to their own um, globalizing and accelerationist regime, one might well wonder. So um, to make some remarks in conclusion, how might our current situation and all the above reflections relate to our wider ongoing and future ecological um, crisis. Many, including me, have noted how during the most severe lockdowns, nature seems to flourish more without us. Birds sing louder, fish return to canals, deer wander more freely and right into the heart of our towns. Others, however, have rightly pointed out how this is somewhat misleading. Red kites, the, the birds, miss roadkill, and many more domesticated animals and plants languish without our tending. It's not actually genuinely ecological to think in terms of humans over against a single unified natural world. No, we are one of many natural agents. And as natural, we have a good and positive, perhaps even biblical and superintending natural role to play. It seems to me a valid naturalistic and theological um, reflection to wonder whether um, 
human beings aren't supposed to be the cosmic gardeners, especially if one adopts the kind of neo-finalism um, which some um, uh, French philosophers are now returning to the conversation uh, have been prepared to entertain in the wake of Henri Bergson above all. The point is not the liberal alternative of either dominating or liberating nature, but the communitarian one of getting the right balance between different natural actors and between an open human subjectivity and relatively more fixed natural agencies or characters, which are all the other species that surround us. They need perhaps our free and adaptable nurture. We need their stimulus and content if we are truly to um, fulfill ourselves as spiritual creatures. A good relationship to nature requires us to get into more immediate personal and non-virtual contact with our local environment, which needs to be more self-governing and self-sufficient in both ecological and political terms. At the same time, we can't ignore our essential humanly specific and planetary unity, which requires far better international coordination if we are to survive, let alone flourish. So there's a, an apparently slightly contradictory demand both for much more subsidiarity and yet for a different kind of global unity, a more genuine um, kind of um, um, uh, international um, cooperation. And to go back uh, to what I've already said, without that kind of international cooperation, then natural threats and exigencies become excuses for further economic and military competition that in a way very much takes us back to the early modern phase of competition between emerging um, nation states for um, natural global um, um, re resources. And, and in the end, this uh, competitive approach to um, ecological crisis can only in the end um, exacerbate. So we do in the end have to consider the question of global politics, I think. Um, it's not desirable and it's incredibly unlikely that there would ever be some form of literal world government directed by personal rulers. On the other hand, for the reasons I've said, global coordination is required. And this can't just be impersonal or a matter of fixed rules and procedures if it's ever going to work. It's got to involve personal care at a global level. There seems to be something here in terms of shared sovereignty and mutual international self-government that is still to be invented. Even if the EU for all its imperfections, at least for um, some period of its existence has gone some way in this direction. More recently, I think it's been far too subverted by um, neoliberal neoliberalism and German bankers, to be candid. But for certain, um, this requirement needs an emergent sense of a global metaphysical culture, a sense of shared global sacrality that can alone um, secure the place of spirit. And so the dignity of human labor alongside all other natural agencies. Even um, a secular commentator like the former Portuguese politician Bruno Maceres is forced to suggest that we need um, a new authoritative and coordinating um, speculator, uh, to use a technical term, like um, the role that the papacy performed in the high Middle Ages. And perhaps we do indeed quite literally 
need um, some kind of revived and more effective papal and ecclesiastical um, vision, influence, and um, coordination. Maybe it's too little remarked that the papacy has, in, in a way, returned to power and respect in, in, in modern times. And in this respect, I think that the work of Pope Francis has been much more in continuity with that of his predecessors than American Catholics um, appear to fantasize. I don't quite know why. I think they don't understand certain things. Otherwise, if, if we don't have that kind of um, coordination, that kind of sort of return, if you like, to a sense of spiritual authority as guiding political authority um, and as, you know, ensuring that we're really pursuing personal flourishing and not just money and, and national or civilizational power and control. If we don't have that, then as Macias vividly says, it's the virus or the successor of the virus that is the real Pope, that is the real um, speculator, um, I think. So if we fail um, to go beyond the dominance of the machine that is capitalism, bureaucracy and technocracy, if we fail to um, achieve a new personalist international order of respect for um, the, 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 the genuine spiritual flourishing, the destiny of human beings indeed in the end for the beatific vision, and, and through humans, the destiny to return to God of all other creatures, then by merely continuing to try to dominate nature and link with, it, with that trying to dominate each other, it's nature that will in the end dominate and destroy human beings.